George started together, he walked in the gym here and he was, uh, he was a martial arts fanatic. When we first actually met, Faraz and I, we were training partner and Faraz is, is Anglophone background, I'm, I'm Francophone. We could not really communicate with each other because my, my, English, were, my English was very bad and his French were not very good. Uh, so we were more communicating in terms of body language in training with each other as a training partner. So we were training together, we were like best friends right away. Why? Because we both had the same passion. I do remember noticing, uh, you know, hearing a lot about George in the gym and he was doing well. And I remember he got matched, I believe the name was Pete Spread. And I remember thinking, wow, that's not going to go well. And George just wiped the floor with him. I think he choked him on the first round and just manhandled him. The oh, he's he's taking his choke. Choke. This one could be over, oh, folks. Oh, and and it's over. over. And I remember that for me, I come from a striking background. I remember that being eye-opening in that, yeah, Pete Spread was a really good striker, but it really didn't matter. And it really changed my perspective as a, as a coach to understand other facets of MMA. Understand it's not just about striking, it's, there's a lot more to it than that. And I think for us was obviously ahead of the curve there in, in recognizing that. Recognizing, yes, you, you have to know how to strike and you have to be good at it, but at the end of the day, if this guy is a much better wrestler and a much better grappler, you're in big trouble. The thing is, back then, a lot of people were doing just jiu-jitsu. And some guys were kind of doing valley tudo. You know, like a mix. But the jiu-jitsu guys were like a click. No, 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 you don't need uh, striking. You don't need this and that. Me and George were really on the MMA boat right away. So a lot of the jiu-jitsu guys did very little striking or very little wrestling. And we were like, no, you need striking, you need wrestling, and you need, you need conditioning too. And so George was one of the first that started to have a bit of everything. He was a very good wrestler. He was a good striker. And I think, I think that set him apart at that time. I just want to say to the uh, American fighter, Soon, a uh, young a Canadian young gun, young gun is coming to kick ass. <laughs> the early days of MMA in TriStar was very difficult. I remember I was training David Loiseau. David Loiseau was the first Quebecois to make it to UFC, so he was really on the edge, the cutting edge of MMA in Montreal and in Quebec. And um, I remember we were preparing for a professional fight and we're training around the clock. I would come in after school, help him, I'd hold pads for him, we'd wrestle. I mean, we're just a handful of guys preparing for a fight. And I remember he fought, he chipped his tooth. I remember him chipping his tooth, he broke his tooth. He won the fight, he won maybe like $1,000, but the dentist bill was about $3,000. Or he had broken a tooth or something, and he needed, a th and I was like, wow, you know, this must be really difficult. We've been training for months, and now we're in the hole. He's in the hole, you know, 2,000 bucks. How could somebody live you know, that, that lifestyle? But it was just people were doing it because they were passionate, they were loving, they loved the sport. They wanted to be, uh, you know, they wanted to be like Hoist Gracie. They wanted to be a star, you know, they wanted to make it. They wanted to show that the martial arts skills were, they were true warriors, true, true uh, martial arts mentality. But even though it was so difficult to live off it. And um, soon later, the market exploded. It grew, you know, but early on, you can't, you can't, Nobody knew that was going to happen. Nobody could tell that the market was going to explode. Dave was exceptionally talented. Um, I love Dave as a person, but it's, I, I, think, I think now that he's, he's doing a lot more coaching and that he'll look back and realize there were a lot of opportunities that he could have had, that he should have had. Sometimes it comes down to just preparation, uh, and I think physical preparation leads to mental preparation. I think when, you, when you've dotted all the I's and crossed all the T's and you've done everything you have to do training-wise, you've sparred with the best guys in the gym, hard, you've really challenged yourself, then I think you have that mental confidence as well as um, you're at ease. You're, you're, at, you're at, in a kind of a peaceful place of whatever happens, happens. I did everything I could. But when you subconsciously feel you know, that you might have cut some corners and didn't quite do things the way you should have, I've seen many, many guys have, the, have that hit them literally going into the ring or going into the cage. And it's interesting, I spoke to George uh, one time after, uh, right after he lost to Matt Serra. And I remember this because it was very telling of, of George's character. Um, he took me aside and he said, you know what, Conrad, it's the best thing that could have happened to me. He said, um, I go, what do you mean? And he goes, 
you know what? I was screwing around. I was partying, I was goofing around, I wasn't sparring with the guys I should have been, I wasn't taking it seriously. And I thought, don't worry, I got this, I got this, it's Matt Serra, I got this. He goes, you know when I realized I didn't have it? He goes, you know when the ref points at you and goes, are you ready? Are you ready? He goes, when the ref pointed at me and said, are you ready? A wave of fear came over me. And I thought, holy shit, I'm not ready for this. I'm gonna get killed. This is what differentiates George from a lot of other athletes. He'll take a moment like that, put the blame on himself, which is where it belongs, and grow from it. He won't repeat a mistake twice. That's something that, that I think George had in his character from very early on that made him get to where, where he is. After I lost my fight with Matt Serra, I was kind of lost because nobody in Montreal was really qualified to, to teach a global MMA system. Everybody was either coming from jiu-jitsu or kickboxing background. Nobody really knew the sport at the time. And uh, Ferras at the time was a training partner of mine and I decided, like I said, he, he always been more, uh, more intellectual than every one of us. And we always went to see Ferras for advice and I, and I decided to, uh, to ask him if he would be interesting to took me under his wing as a trainer. Because I know he's, I, 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 I personally felt very confident to have Ferras on my side. I wore a lot of hats for George, you know, I was his striking coach, I was his grappling coach as well, I was his wrestling coach, along with a lot of great other coaches, of course, you know, we were heavily mentored by John Danahar and many other great coaches, but a lot of times we were just me and him, so I'd have to polish up all his, his arts as well, and I was also his security guard, and I was also his mental coach as well, of course we worked with Brian Kane, a mental coach, but I also helped push him uh, a little bit further, because George was a very nervous guy. Before I fight, I always get very nervous, very excited, very scared because of doubt. Uh, this feeling of uncertainty, it, it's very hard and it's hard, barely uh, tolerable. I would always try to tell him to never see his opponent as greater than he is or inferior to what he is. You know, people always say the glass is half full or the glass is half empty. Leibniz, a great German philosopher, says, look, see the glass as it actually is. It's at half its capacity. It's not half full and it's not half empty, it's half its capacity. So when he was fighting, for instance, uh, Matt Serra, you know, the first time around, he might have overlooked Matt Serra. He looked at Matt Serra as lower than what he is. And he was surprised. And sometimes when he, you know, when he fought BJ Penn, especially the first time, he thought BJ Penn was more than, you know, what, maybe what he was. George, you're just as good as him. And we were always trying to bring back his mind to seeing things as they truly are. I know if Ferraz tell me to do something in a fight, I just do it. Uh, it's very important you have that, 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 that connection with your trainer, that you trust him, you trust his judge, judgment. And before I, I had great trainer, but I didn't trust them with my life as much as I trust Ferras. Trust Ferras, he would tell me something, I will, I will do it without even hesitation, if, if, without even questioning what his judgment, because that's how, that's, how, that's how much I trust him. You know, sometimes he would fight a guy, he would tell me, oh, that guy has a lot of knockout power. And I, was, and I would cross-examine I, I cross him, his fears, like, like a lawyer would. And I'd be like, why do you say that? Well, he knocked out his last two opponents. What round did he knock them out in the first round? Has he ever knocked out a guy in the second or third? Nope. Oh, so he's powerful in the first two minutes. Oh, yes, yeah, so he'd have a realization. So if after the first two minutes, what, is, what happens statistically to his knockout power? Well, he has 20 other fights that didn't go to knockout. So he would start, I would start to cross-examine him a lot. I will put him on the witness stand a lot and I'll cross-examine his fears. And I think when you cross-examine your fears, you find a lot of times that they're not so big and scary. UFC 94 was the most important fight in, in TriStar's history, in my opinion. There were so many important dynamic elements to that fight. Number one, GSP was world champion and he was taking on BJ Penn who was also world champion. And they were shooting the primetime. Now it was the first primetime special they had ever shot. So UFC now was embarking in a new endeavor to promote the fight. I remember that we were all like flabbergasted going, what the hell is this all about? You know, like the guys were waltzing in the gym, which was a normal like sparring day. The fight was promoted globally. They followed us. I remember the camera crew was following us around every day for 30 days. So for us, it was completely new. I was like, what the hell is going on here, you know? It's, so we didn't understand this thing. So we just like kept doing our normal thing and we had no clue that it would have blew out of proportion.
Now, we all know George won that fight, and he did it in spectacular fashion. And before that fight, nobody knew how the fight was going to go. I mean, we were extremely nervous, prepping, put our heart, putting our heart and soul in this preparation. But after UFC 94, things changed. I mean, the gym just exploded. I was going to the U.S., and people were recognizing me. George was going to the U.S. We used to go to the U.S., and, and people would recognize us, kind of. We would come home, and nobody would really recognize us. But now when we were traveling back and forth, everybody knew me and George. Freddie Roach was willing to work with us. Raleigh Ostima, Hodger Gracie, you know, world champions from different disciplines. Where if we called them and asked them to come down to train with us, or we wanted to go train with them, they would pick up our calls. You know, people respected us, they knew us, and we just became part of that, that group, you know. So we used that exposure to, to snowball our, our experience. I became a much better trainer after UFC 94. Why? Because I started to train with many great trainers in their art. When George would bring in a trainer, I would definitely go in as a student. So when he brought in, you know, Muay Thai champions, I would go as a student. I would take the class with George because my number one priority was education. I wanted to learn everything that these guys know. And because my goal is to be the greatest MMA trainer in the world. And if you're going to be an MMA trainer, you need to know every single discipline to a T. And that's my goal. I want to know everything. What will be the byproduct of all this focus and training? That remains to be seen. Will the gym get bigger? Will it get smaller? I don't know. I will continue to follow uh, this path. You know, I, I will continue to learn martial arts till the end.